Well, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by a, a new kid on the plot as far as it comes to McLean's TV, Doug Stevenson. And Doug, you're here. Tell the people why you're here and uh, why you're associated with McLean's. Well, I'm here to hopefully be the first power rider to compete at an able-bodied Olympics in dressage. And Paul McLean has kindly offered to help me out financially with keeping the horses on the road and making my dream become a reality, really. Well, for people who are looking at this now, you're blind. Mm -hmm. You had vision up to about the age of 18, yeah. uh, good vision up to 18, and then uh, your disease kicked in, and now basically you've lost all your sight. Yeah, no, that's pretty much it. I started losing my sight when I was 18, and it was just deteriorating from then on, really, and I lost the last bit of sight last April and now I'm completely one completely blind you know I'd be classified as B1 which is no sight at all. How difficult was that on a personal level the fact that you had vision you could see and now you can see nothing? It was tough at the start when I started losing it because I was extremely active I played a lot of sport and so to go from a really active person training maybe 10 or 11 times a week to not being able to do that that was that was mad like it was extremely difficult obviously and but as the sight started getting worse when it when I lost the last bit of sight it was almost a relief as such because every time I'd lost a little bit more I was having to readjust the way of doing things and you know re readapting in my surroundings and figuring out new ways how to make my way around the house and do different things and you'd be comfortable for maybe a couple of weeks and then you'd lose a bit more and then you'd have to readapt all over again and that was pretty much the worst I'd say mentally. I think anybody listening to this and I know I was stuck by it too, even the bravery in that answer there, the fact that you knew you were losing your sight and how you almost wished for it to happen because you could start a new chapter in your life it's incredible. Yeah, no, like it's, it does sound mad, but it was, it was a relief because it couldn't get any worse. I knew, you know, you have to hit rock bottom before you start going up again. And it was, it's great because now I'm the happiest I've been in years. I really am. You know, I have a way of doing things. I can focus, I can manage around the house and do the horses and don't have to worry about maybe you know, going to bed and waking up and not having a bit more, you know, like it's... Well, now, look, wait a minute, you've got an accent there which is sort of St. Field-esque. <laughs> Tell us a wee bit about the history. Where, you know, where, where's this accent coming from? I'm originally South African. I was born and bred in South Africa and uh -huh. lived the first 13 years there. And both my parents are South African, but my granddad is originally Irish. And um, moved over to Ireland 11 years ago and lived in Dublin for about nine years, and then I was on the Curra in Kildare for a couple of years, and I've been living in Sainfield for the last four years now. Now, you have a brochure here because uh, you, you kindly sent this to me and, and to McLean's as well, and uh, it says that uh, despite being blind and not let this condition hold me back, I want to make history by being the first para rider to represent their country at an able-bodied Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to aim, you may as well aim high. That yeah. is aiming high. That is incredible, isn't it? If, if you achieve that, that's amazing. Well, I don't think it's going to be, if I achieve it, I'll just see it as a, when I'm going to do it. You know, like, it's going to be a tough ask to do it for Rio 2016, but I'm pretty certain I could do it for Tokyo 2020. You know, I, I'm in a great position. I have some good sponsors, McLean included, and... I have a great trainer and I'm crazy enough to do it and I'm not scared of the horses or anything. I just get on and do it and if I fall off, I get back on and I'm all about pushing boundaries and that's just what I'm about. You know, I'm a sports person and I want to be the best that I can be, but competing with the best. No. Uh, I'm going to ask you this question because uh, this is the one that really intrigues me. Uh, you're blind, mm -hmm. uh, you're fine, you're fit, you're 100% with, with regard to fitness. 
uh, you suddenly jump on a horse. How the hell do you do this? Tell me how you actually do it. How do you do the dressage on top of the horse, blind? There must be a serious amount of trust between you and your animal and vice versa. There is a lot of trust between, you know, me and my horse and there's a lot of thinking involved as well. Like an international dressage size arena is 20 meters long by, I mean, 20 meters wide by 60 meters long. And there's markers at different points in the arena that mm -hmm. are marked with letters. And I just work day in and day out counting the strides between the markers. So I know between a certain marker and another marker, there's six strides. And that's how I go about navigating around the arena. I do have, at the big shows and stuff, I have my trainer who calls the letters for me. Mm -hmm. So as I'm approaching, say, A, maybe a stride out, she'd say A. So I know that A is coming up at the next stride in case there's a certain movement to do at A. But then there's also remembering your test because you can't have the test called. So I have to remember my test, know where I am roughly, and know how many strides it is to the next marker before I have to do a certain movement. And say there's a 10 meter circle going straight into half pass. I know that there's eight trot strides and then the, your half pass will be 14 trot strides to the side. Then you have to go forward, you know, so it's all, Mentally, it's exhausting, <laughs> but <laughs> it's just practice. And, you know, like I've always wanted to do horses for a living. And mm -hmm. I've always, you know, always wanted to be a jockey, following my granddad's footsteps. But obviously, sight, I wasn't able to do that and came to dressage by default. But if I got my sight back tomorrow, there's no way I'd change. You know, I wouldn't go racing or become a jockey because it's dressage is an art. You know, it's the smallest of movements make the world a difference. Like maybe your leg going back two inches from the girth means something completely different to the horse than mm -hmm. putting your leg forward two inches. Yes. You know, like it's just, it's amazing and they're an amazing creature. And Is it the same horse? Or do you use different horse each time? Or um, I have a really good horse at the minute he is getting a bit old, but he's been to two Olympic games, he's been to three European championships. What do you call him? What's his name? Yuri. Yeah, well, Yuri has to get a wee bit of publicity, you know, they do it. He's part of a, of a very famous double act at this stage now. Yeah, no, Yuri is, um, he was the one and only representative for the Irish para team at Beijing Olympics. Eilish Byrne, who was his old rider, took him to Beijing on her own, represented the country. It was brilliant. And then he went to a few European championships in between then and London. And he competed with Eilish in London as well. And he won a bronze medal. So he is a superstar in his own right. And I was fortunate to come across him. You know, Eilish decided that she was going to sell him. And I was lucky enough to be the one who bought him. And he is been the one that's you know I'm, I'm looking here to to already you know goals achieved to date you know you've competed against uh, able-bodied riders at national level you know mm -hmm. you know you've uh, competed the national championships the Irish national novice champion and Irish national under 20 you know under 25 champion so already you've been there and you bought several of the t-shirts yeah no I like I said I was my first year, I've only been doing dressage since I went blind, you know, because like I said, I came to it by default, but I have a great horse, I have a great trainer, and I'm stubborn enough to want to be the best. And yeah. it's not just a matter of, you know, beating other power riders, you know, like I think, you know, the best way of gauging how good you are is going out and, you know, trying to beat able-bodied people because the, we're not that different. Yeah, we have a disability, but that doesn't mean anything, essentially. You know, I can't see, but my limbs function, my, you know, my arms, my legs, everything else works perfectly. So why not? You know, I don't see a need to go and be categorized and put in this category and say that you go and play with those people, you know. But so we were lucky enough. We went to the national championships, which we qualified for, and I was hoping for a top 10, mm -hmm. you know, because I was just, I wasn't 
it was my first national championships and yeah. I hadn't been doing dressage too long and it was just brilliant. It was great. We came out and we won our first day and then we won the second day as well because it was the novice championship. It's over three days. So it's the average of all three days put in together. And yeah, we finished overall winner, which was great. And then the icing on the cake was the under 25 championships, which there were 40 entries, I think. And we were the best in that one too, so. I, I, I just think that's amazing. It's interesting too, you talk about, you have a great horse, great trainer, great supporters. Uh, your mommy and daddy must be great supporters of you too. And as well, you know, your, your, your grandfather gave you this, um, this the, the, this whole urge almost, you know, to be involved with horses, etc. like that, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, you, you've clearly come from a very, very uh, strong family background, which, which is also uh, clearly part of your whole ambition and your whole drive as well. They're clearly very supportive of you. Yes, no, they really are my granddad more than anyone, you know, because that's what he wanted us to carry on and follow in his footsteps and mm -hmm. be involved with horses, whether it was show jumping, dressage or And what racing. did he do? You say he was a jockey. What did he do? He um, he was a jockey in his... Who was he actually? Sorry. His name is Henry Grattan Yes. Um, he was a jockey here in Ireland and he point to point it and then ran under rules and he also trained horses um he won the latouche which is a big race in punchestown two years in a row and i think he's the only trainer still to hold that title yes. to do it two years back to back and he's a great man he's been across he's been all over the globe he trained race horses in zimbabwe also in india he helped set up uh, the shanghai equestrian academy in india and now he's back in Ireland enjoying his retirement but still heavily involved in horses and enjoys coming up and seeing me and the horses and still goes to all the race meetings and everyone knows him so I, w I would say the whole family circle and friends and stuff they got must be yeah, I've only met you and I, I feel a great pride for you the, the, the pride that they must feel for you must be immense for what you've achieved yeah no it really is you know my mum was obviously extremely delighted when I'd won the nationals and I went and I was second in my first ever international and I think it was great for her more than anyone else in the family because you know my condition is a genetic thing that's a mother carrying gene so yes. I think from her point of view she kind of felt the cause of it you know she felt that she was responsible for this happening to me so for her, I'm delighted because I'm going out and doing it. And I think she's, you know, equally as proud and it, it's a bit more special to her, I think. So you've arrived in here to McLean headquarters in the Lisburn Road. And uh, I know you're in a bit of a hurry because uh, you're with the horses this morning. You're going to be with the horses this afternoon. Uh, every single day com uh, comprised of you working with the horses. Uh, so we talk about able-bodied athletes, as we would call them. I was talking to a few earlier on. They were... They couldn't get over what you were doing, you know, and they trained very hard to, 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 to be the best. What's your training schedule like? It's Equ intense. Equally as bad, is it, I'm sure? Yeah, it's every day, three, six, five, seven days a week. You know, it's every day without fail. Rain, hail, snow, <laughs> the horses need out of their stables. They need ridden, they need exercised. And to be the best, you've got to, you know, be willing to put in the work and go out and produce the goods. So. You're talking now about the fact that you might make uh, Tokyo, uh, you know, to, to achieve that and become the first para rider to compete among able-bodied at the Olympic Games, like, that, that would be immense. It would just be, it would be incredible, I feel, and I'm just listening to what you're telling me. I think it'll be brilliant, and I think, you know, the whole para able-bodied um, situation has it's been brilliant since London, you know, mm -hmm. you did have the likes of Oscar Pistorius who came and competed in the able-bodied Olympics and since then para sports have grown since London. It's been amazing, you know, there's been people crawling out of the, the woodwork wanting to get involved in different sports yes. and I've noticed even in para equestrian, you know, the, member, the members have almost doubled, mm -hmm. you know, people want to and it's inspired people and I think it's great and to be able to go out and achieve that and go out and compete against able-bodied people there's no reason you know we 
can't do it either. You know, I think it's it's great, and we'll just strive and keep going. Well, Doug, I wish you all the very, very best for the future. We'll keep in touch with your progress as well. You talk about people going and competing at the highest level and inspiring people. I have to say, I know you've inspired me this morning just by this conversation. I wish you every single success and uh, wish you all the very best for the future. And thanks for joining us here in McLean's. Thank you very much. No problem.